welcome to Life and Liberty Radio with David Householder. I'm Josh Jose, and together you and I are taking another step toward freedom, both spiritual and political. So get comfortable, breathe in, and ignite your imagination. Envision a society that is spiritually deep and truly free. It's easy if you try. This is Dave Householder for Life and Liberty, and I'm here with Paul Marzan. He is the pastor of Crossroads Church. It's a United Methodist congregation, and he's been part of the United Methodist faith family for a long time. Uh, Paul, welcome to the program. It's a joy to be here. Now, now Paul, you're, you're kind of a different kind of church here. Out where we live, the Methodists really... Uh, they're just sort of functionary type churches and stuff, and yet you've got a real creative thing going. You're always trying new things, and you you stay with the ship, sort of. You sort of believe in the organization, and it talk. What, what's driving that? What's well, I'm a fifth generation United Methodist here in Minnesota, and uh, wow. grew up on a farm nearby. Still, still have the farm, and so I feel that Wesley really started a great movement of just kind of the balance of uh, social holiness and personal piety. And um, I think that uh, some ancestors started some really awesome churches, but somehow through the years, some of those churches kind of morphed into really not being Methodist anymore. So I've always wondering, what is the method? I mean, <laughs> if you're a Methodist, what is the method? Well, I mean, that, that was a nickname he was given because he was uh, a little bit disciplined. And actually, the book we follow is actually called the Book of Discipline. We have the Bible and the Book of Discipline. Really? Yeah. Okay, so there's actually a method to your madness. The method to the madness, you got it. And um, he he had what's called the Wesley Quadrillo, Scripture, Experience, Reason, and Tradition. He said the balance of your Scripture, you need to use both your head and your heart. Okay, so so basically it was, it was a renewal movement from yeah. back, what, late 1700s or early 1700s? Yeah, the so. Anglicans and Episcopalians had sprung off of that from England. And then there were some Moravians and Germans that jumped in along the way, just kind of like the Lutherans. And uh, when they all came to America in 1776, they, they started to form a new denomination here. So So the Methodists basically... Uh, our renewal movement that became an organization, and of course, keeping that renewal thing going is always a challenge because it never lasts more than <laughs> half a generation. It, it's yeah, it's hard to keep it past the second generation. And actually, that's why I've been very blessed. Is uh, I see a lot of young people uh, coming back to the Methodist movement. In fact, there's this huge movement of evangelicals kind of coming into old line liberal guard, if you will, of the '60s who finished seminary are now retiring. And who's filling up those churches and filling up some of those new vacancies are young men and women who say, you know, I want Jesus to be relevant. And so I see my job is to kind of come alongside them and, and support them and encourage them and uh, help them really live out their dream in ministry. Well, the Methodist Church has so many assets, too, and, and not just real estate assets, but outdoor ministry and camping and all the different things that are there which would cost a fortune to put back <laughs> together. And yeah. just, just all of the facilities and all the things that are there and of course, a lot of know-how and uh, universities, colleges, those kinds of things. So, but some people say, "Well, you know, Methodist universities aren't even Methodist anymore." What would you, what, what would you say to that? Um, there are some uh, fairly liberal Methodist universities. I attended one for college and for my seminary. But uh, in the likewise, in within the midst of all that liberalism, there's really a, what I call true liberalism, which is the exploration of ideas. And whenever you truly explore ideas and seek out truth, what you typically find is you find God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so ultimately it's a great place to, to dialogue about ideas and theology because even in the midst of liberalism, God wins out. Basically that does happen. I was, I was at a Methodist, I think it's a Methodist school at Asbury. Yeah. And I got to speak at chapel and the president, it was, I can't remember if it was the college or the, or the seminary. They're right mm -hmm. next to each other. It's a long time ago. But the president got up and talked about how let's just stop for prayer and let's see what happens. And they called off <laughs> classes for the rest of the morning. And there was wow. this, this big prayer thing up, broke out at a typical Methodist school. So there still is some of that, there's still some fire in the furnace. There's a lot of fire in the furnace, and I'm actually really encouraged by the next generation coming in because it seems like the more liberal uh, persons who really didn't you know, think that Jesus was that important anyway in the church <laughs> aren't bothering to come at all anymore. Mm -hmm. And so those that maybe have grown up um, kind of really exploring Christ in a really uh, strange and but maybe fun fashion, I have now said, hey, you know, I think I'd like to come either back to Methodism or maybe explore Methodism because it's not as rigid or judgmental as some of the other evangelical traditions. And so in the best worlds, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, jokingly, people say, well, Methodists are just Baptists who can read. So, I mean, so, <laughs> That's so, true, yeah. So, yeah. so there, there, is, there is a literacy to the, to the movement, and there's, there is a, a certainly an intellectual... That's it, right. And, and you know, and, and, but if you look at, you know, you have Hillary Clinton and, and George Bush, both Methodists, you know, and in essence, that's kind of the Methodist church in a nutshell, is you, you kind of have both extremes. 
And somewhere in that dialogue, you know, truth wins out, and, and a lot of things get accomplished. Well, George W. Bush, of course, came to faith, a powerful faith, in a Methodist church later in life. He was raised Anglican or Episcopal or something, yep. and it was a Methodist church where he went into recovery and, and learned how to do some life change. Exactly. So, so where, where, where would you tell a young pastor to think, well, I better get, I better get out of this whatever denomination he or she happens to be in, and you know they're thinking, hey, you know, this, it's old school, it's you know politically wrong or whatever, and I need to go out and go on my own. And there's maybe good reasons to go on their own, but what uh, what reasons would they have to stay in a faith family or to, to join a faith family? I think one of the things that we're back to West's quote of scripture, experience, reason, tradition. There are a lot of good traditions that the church has, and so we have to kind of remember that as well. That even though the some of the more modern traditions are probably only twenty to thirty years old, <laughs> maybe we got to you know go back a generation and get the older traditions. And I think also that the institution um, can also be an organism, not just an organization. And so I think some people, I encourage them to get back in and breathe new life into the, the organism, not the organization. Now, for some of us, it's, it's a little bit tougher. There's part there's those of us who are in denominational faith families who get kicked out for whatever reason. Yeah, that might happen to me yet. I'm, I'm, waiting, I'm, waiting, I'm waiting for <laughs> that to happen. Drop, yeah. and, and so um, it's sometimes challenging to, to, uh, to stay in a faith family, to, to make things happen. But I do believe that there, there is something valuable about continuity. There's something about not just aping what our ancestors did, but there's something about the language that gets passed down in a, or, or a national culture or all the different things that happen that are somewhat worthwhile. You don't take everything your grandparents mm-hmm. believed in, but there's some things there that are kind of valuable. I think very valuable. I mean, I always think of my, my grandma Frida, and at her time she would be called a progressive probably because she was against, she was in the part of the Women's Christians Temperance Union, and she was for oh, women. kind of radical progressives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's kind of scared women. <laughs> women's suffrage, you know, yeah. and all that in the 20s, and now I'm laughing because uh, the church where she would rally, which was called Wesley Church in downtown Minneapolis, and all the big rallies were held, and um, is now where I'm, I've got one of our multi-site campuses. And I think of that prayer tower where Grandpa Mason and Grandma Frieda would go to the top, and it was five stories tall, which was tall at that time in the 1800s, in the early 1900s. And um, during the, the 18, 1918 to 1921 period, during the World War, praying for women's suffrage, praying for uh, temperance in that tower. And now I'm pastoring in that very same church. That is so exciting. And sometimes, I know in the Anglican tradition, you get churches like Holy Trinity in, in Brompton in London that, that actually buy up, they stayed in the denomination, the Church of England, and they actually buy up old what they call redundant congregations and revitalize them with new people. And so you're doing some of that stuff here, but that's kind of an uphill thing because it's challenging. <laughs> it's very challenging, and we're not uh, it's quite a larger church as that one you mentioned. We're we're kind of a smaller church, and um, uh, I went to a training recently with Rick Warren, and he, he gave me a great phrase that I'm going to use, and he just said, you know, you're a medium-sized church with mega impact. Ooh, I like uh, that. And what I like about it is he says, you, you, I think the... The fallacy is that large churches do everything. And what he said is really, if you're a medium-sized church, he called us tiger churches. We can protect the rabbit churches, the smaller ones. And he called himself an elephant church. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> but he said... Well, well, he's we, a well-fed young man. Yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but um, he, uh, he, that, what I really liked about that is it really encouraged me to think, you know, I don't have to be a mega church or a large church to plant other churches or to support young pastors. As a medium-sized church of three to 500, you can get a lot of ministry and support a lot of people. That's great. Would you bless us by by praying for the young leaders in the church who are thinking about coming back into the church or people that are kind of wondering where they should go with with leadership and uh, just pray for guidance for them? I would love to, Dave. Thanks. Gracious and loving God, we just uh, pray a blessing upon all those that are exploring their call. Um, We know that many times that God speaks to us just as he did to so many that have gone before us, of Abraham calling him out to to go to a a new land, or Moses, or even the early disciples. And so, Lord, we know that you have called out a lot of young men and women that uh, maybe are resisting that call because of their denomination or because of maybe the structures around them. And so, Lord, I just pray that as they listen to your still small voice, that they hear that call and are able to respond in loving ways and, and to really transform lives uh, for the world's sake. And Lord, I pray especially that if there's somebody here today listening to this, that they're just even thinking about pursuing that call, that they would talk to their pastor or talk to somebody else that they could maybe give them a spirit of encouragement and also give them some wisdom as to how to follow that call. I just pray for all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, Paul Mars on a Crossroads Church in Dakota County. It's a United Methodist congregation. Thanks so much for being on the program. Paul, how do people get a hold of your ministry on the website? Or Yeah, it's pretty simple, www.crossroadschurch.org. How did you find that URL? That's amazing. <laughs> I did it in 1995 when people don't think it was that important. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> yep. well, thanks for being on the program. Take care.
That's all for now, and thank you for spending this part of your life journey with us. Please tell others about this online magazine, and we welcome your comments on the website. If you haven't already, consider subscribing so that we can let you know about upcoming topics. And please bless us by clicking on our advertising banners from time to time. I'm Lisa Goodwin, signing off for Life and Liberty. Thank you.